why don't you define VO2 max and then we're going to come back to this point because I want to make sure people can internalize and maybe even one day experience what you just described. So VO2 max is normally defined as the maximum oxygen your body is able to consume uh, over a minute, a full minute. Um, but this is also something that is debated, is less of, let's say, protocol uh, influenced, but it is still, you can still go out and do, for example, uh, efforts out in the field and you will be able to produce higher numbers than what you would be able to do on a standard graded exercise protocol. So this is also a little bit of where it's 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 not that's been the case for me. Yes. Right. You know, I've shared with you my day I've shared my data with you. So um my I like to do it on my bike on a hill. So take a take a Good hill place. that's gonna be, you know, it's not too steep, six percent grade. You're in the saddle the whole time and you're in the big chain ring and it is go for broke and make sure you're dead at the top. Four minutes of climbing and that produces a VO2 max. There's yep. going to be a level usually near the very top of the hill in the last minute where I reach the maximum volume of oxygen that I'm consuming. Now indoors, I for some reason hate doing it on a stationary bike. So instead I do it on a Stairmaster. Um, so now I'm just sprinting upstairs doing the same thing. Um, I get a comparable number, but it's a little bit lower. Now what I haven't done yet, and I was going to try to do it before we met, today, but I kind of ran out of time. I was traveling last weekend. I have a prediction, which is I think I would have a, vi a higher VO2 max running on a treadmill, even though I'm very inefficient running, because my heart rate is always higher when I run than when I cycle. Do you think that would be the case? Normally, I would say uh, that should be the case. Um, but it, it it is also... Um, where there can also be other factors also uh, involved in it. Uh, like one of the places where uh, this is something that have quite uh, um, passed me is that, for example, Formula One drivers, they yeah. sit in for almost, let's say, one and a half hour with yep. extremely high heart rates. Um, but having looked at that telemetry very closely, yes, a lot of that is driven by the G-forces. It's because I've, I mean, the first time I looked at an F1 driver's telemetry, I was like, there's a mistake. These are just errors. Like these aren't real numbers because I had never seen such rapid changes from low to high to high to low. Um, and then I realized they were all corresponding to either very, very strong break points or very, very fast corners. And then I, you know, obviously the only thing that's common to that is something about 5G on the body is dramatically doing that. Now it would be very interesting if we could do it, I don't know how you would do it, would be to measure VO2 and see if it has a commensurate change. Exactly. What would you hypothesize? So this is, I think also uh, when when you are doing uh, these, so it could also be like jet fighters as well, but- uh, uh, Yes, yeah. I would imagine that's even more pronounced for them. Yeah, uh, well- uh, And it, we it, could actually you, measure you, that because they're already yes, in a mask. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So so you could say that in, in, in dog fighting, for sure, then I think you will actually be pretty much maybe- True stress. Same as, as Formula One, but, but I think that uh, if you're just pu pushing really high G-forces uh, in one direction, then it would maybe not be as high, even if it's a prolonged one. The reason for that is because I think that the G-forces, obviously you're trying to counteract that. So you're mobilizing every bit of muscles that are in your body in order to, 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 to stay exactly where you need to stay and to be- uh, But there's a slight difference, which maybe you're about to get to, so I apologize if you are. There's got to be also a part of that heart rate that is coming from the compromised venous return to the heart due to either the Valsalva or the actual impeding of the inferior vena cava, right? So I would think at a high enough G-force, part of that high heart rate is stroke volume has gone way down because preload is way down. Again, I sorry, I should make sure everyone understands what we're saying. Um, when you fill the heart less with blood, um, you don't stretch the muscles out. That's called preload. So the heart needs to be preloaded with lots of blood volume so it can get a good squeeze. And anything that prevents that, either dehydration or literally forces that are preventing the blood returning to the heart, could make you know make that high heart rate really a product of tiny, tiny little uh, ineffective beats. 
Yes, um, uh, uh, and th that's also um, we we we've, we've done some studies on that. Actually, it just also there are some other very in, in high G force athletes. N no, actually, in 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 let's say in similar because it's quite interesting to see that what happens also with the muscles. So when when obviously when you come over a certain uh, so when you do work. The, or do when you do pro you produce a certain amount of power obviously two there are forces involved and there is velocity involved these forces uh, uh, requires a certain amount of recruitment of muscle fibers and these muscle fibers at a certain point will actually start to cause vasoconstriction so they actually start squeezing off the blood supply they normally mm. act also as a pump they actually help pumping blood around in the body Less, and, you know, promoting uh, preloading. But the interesting thing is that we do see that where you also um, get in the area of anaerobic threshold is actually where you are starting to come to the point where you're squeezing off the blood flow as well in the muscles. And this happens around ballparkish. Obviously, there is a fairly yeah. large range, but ballparkish around 30% of your 1RM. So there you got another way. So you should never experience that on a bike, right? Because in theory, you know, it's hard to imagine you could ever come close to 30% of a 1RM force on a pedal stroke. Could you? Um, that's true. That, yeah, that's true. It seems, yeah, it seems, so, so, so you, well, well, I mean, maybe there's an extreme moment yeah, you're, you're yeah, at a 16% yeah. grade or something like that, I guess. It's possible, huh? Yeah, for sustained efforts, obviously you can do for short efforts. You can get very, very close, but yeah, yeah. but 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 for sustained ones, yes, I would agree. Um, uh, but coming back to coming back to uh, uh, running versus uh, running versus uh, the bike, uh, so which was the let's say the place where you where it started. Um, Normally, I would say that yes, in in running, uh, you would at least the submaximal efforts have a higher uh, view to max. The only thing is that we see that in people that are let's say somewhat balanced trained, so they do yeah. they spend uh, let's say a fair bit, uh, they spend some time on the bike, they spend some time on running. Yeah. Then normally there are more muscles involved for a longer duration in cycling than it is in running. So when you test Christian or Gustav, if you were to have them fresh on two separate days, and on one day you put them on the bike, and on one day you put them on the treadmill, mm -hmm. and you have them do a VO2 max test, what would be the approximate difference you would, you would see in them? Uh, if actually, when I started working with them, then it was then it was uh, then it was close to a significant a significant difference between uh, cycling and running, and even more in swimming. So then, higher in swimming, no Lower. lowest, lowest in swimming actually, and that comes also back to also the one other thing also because one thing is also when we talk about preloading and how how this also affects it. One thing that also is hmm. is is uh, uh, one have to, what what well, I actually were stupid enough to to teach Christian and Gustav this in uh, a long time ago, and that is that if they wanted to have a very high view to max. Obviously, if you're trained, you will see this immediately on the breathing patterns. But if you are, if you basically, what you can do to to create an artificially high view to max is that you basically, you you when you come pretty close to your your all out effort, if you try to restrict your breathing, let's say for a short short time there, you will create a depth, and this depth will actually boost the numbers even higher. But so this is our this is the VO two max <laughs> hack for everybody watching. Us. How do I boost my because my my, my 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 hack for boosting VO two max is weight loss, right? It's like yeah, just figure out a way to lose five pounds in the week leading up to the test, and you're you know it it goes up. And obviously knowing how to train for it, right? Yeah. I mean if you train in those intervals. So you're saying if you restrict breathing um, as you get close to that failure point, each yeah. breath you take becomes that much more of yes. an oxygen explosion. And, and and even there, you can even train yourself also to the point where it will have a. You're not talking about marginal differences in your VO2. You can spike the numbers up to extreme numbers if if you if you practice this a little bit. That aside, I think it's important <laughs> here to remember that that's not equivalent to getting fitter. It's just a way of basically manipulating something in the body, and you're cheating a protocol. Yeah. Um. And it's not your let's say VO2 max. Uh, yeah. Per but for se. those yeah. listening to this who have a bet with their friends about who's going to have the highest VO2 max, this becomes their little trick. Yes, then definitely you can do this and you will get some really nice numbers. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. How, how much of a, a boost would you get? Like, let's say you're a person who just doing the protocol normally is 60. Yeah. What, 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 with, with no other change other than this breathing trick, what would you take that to? 
I, I think also one one thing I want to add here just before answering that, because I think also here is view to max for me uh, in the same way as power. You can look at it in relative terms and absolute terms as well. So obviously losing weight and yeah, you're so doing- Yeah, so let's, let's yes. say it's five liters. Yes. And yeah. based on the weight that comes out to 60. Yeah. So uh, I would say that in this case here, uh, it will probably, it comes very much down to technique, but if you practice this a little bit that you can boost it above 70. What? <laughs> Not a problem. Wow. <laughs> I thought you were going to say 64, 65 no, no, or something no, no. like that. I, 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 I've, seen, I've, seen some, I've, I've seen some crazy numbers. It is basically, I don't, need, I don't even have to go into the raw data. You just see it on the screen and say, okay, now it's, uh, now it's playing around. But wait around. a minute though. Yeah. It doesn't that sort of fly in the face of our definition of VO2 max, which is it's the highest oxygen consumption you sustain for one minute. And I mean, because to me that would be like, because I know when I do my test, um, I think I'm always checking for 60 second average and I'm not ever just looking at the peak. So, cause it's, it's very noisy data. So in this breathing technique, don't you just get a really big spike that is otherwise noise in the one minute best effort? And uh, no, so it would be a little bit more prolonged than that if okay. you create, if you create, a, a, an oxygen, uh, depth in, in your body. But one thing that I think also here is important to, because this is also one of the things that is a little bit challenging when you read uh, a lot of research too, is that very often we take that research for, for, for granted or, or it's good. And then there, are, there is a lot of things that are around it that we don't have access to or we don't know. And also one thing that also is sometimes a challenge is for people to understand also whether the technology they are using, one, is it good for what you really are doing here? So you can get a lot of machines that can do measure some kind of uh, oxygen uptake or ratios and other things, but it doesn't mean that it necessarily is a good instrument for what you want to do. And the second part of it also is that we have to understand, well, like where are we measuring? And obviously in this case, when we do oxygen me measurement, we measure it on the exhaust yep. and not in the muscles. Like, and yep. that's also an, 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 an important difference here because if we go to the point, and I think maybe we, we, we're gonna run out of time if we continue on this path here, but if, if, if basically you look at uh, cellular or, or basically cell respiration, the numbers you'll you'll see there in well much higher is, is in it's since it's, i remember this from our last discussion it's we're not we're league. not limited yeah. at the cell no yeah so so th again here i think it comes ma more down to just staying true to some principles that, yeah. that and just that make can, it reproducible yeah. yeah and that mean that obviously a great like the good thing with view to max testing is that they're the generally um, accepted standard for doing this is a graded exercise test and and you go through that and it will produce fairly um, comparable numbers uh, for most people to relate to. There will be some differences.